Hello everybody out there. Uh, this is Sila on Yeshua and this is um, the seventh one. So uh, let's get started. <laughs> um, this one is Psalms 24 and we're just going to go over uh, I believe the whole chapter of Psalms 24 which is really a good psalm. Um, so let's get started uh, with this is just the first verse. <laughs> let's talk about the first verse. Psalm 24 a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Okay, and so the first thing I thought when I heard that is uh, uh, all the earth and everything on it is Jesus, right? Um, for Jesus, uh, it's, and it's also for Jesus and held together by Jesus, right? Okay, so... Um, and you can see that in, in um, nature and the creation itself. There's all type of things like the sand dollar and um, you know the different color uh, stones and stuff like that um, that are out there. What are they called? Fairy stones or fairy crosses that are in the earth that are stones that actually are, they come out of the earth in the shape of crosses and stuff. Uh, there's, there's many different things that's like that, you know, that you can look into creation and see things about, you know, Jesus and because he is everything <laughs> and in everything. It's all about Jesus, not about us. And we can see that in 1 Corinthians 10, 26. Uh, For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Fullness, everything is the Lord's, okay? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says this. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So you see, he, he consists in all things, and he makes all things consist together, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, um, all right, did I go too far? For it pleased the Father no, that okay. in him should all fullness dwell. So in, in him all fullness dwell. So it's crazy because like everything is in him, but yet he is everything out there, right? It's like the dimensions thing I was talking about on my other dimensions video. It's it's weird. It's like the dimensions wrap around each other, but they're, Jesus is in control of all of them. It's crazy. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Okay, so, and see, notice here how it talked about the cross, the blood of his cross by him uh, to reconcile all things to himself. And I believe that's why we see the cross a lot out there. Like even in the stars and stuff, the darling of the universe and all that stuff, you see a cross in it. Uh, it it's it's representing him. And, and I have a strong belief that when it, like, the sign of the Son of Man, when he comes back, that this is going to be something to do with the cross, that everyone will see it, that it, somehow him and the cross will split reality open. Or maybe when the sun went dark and everything happened, right that time on the crucif uh, on, when he was being crucified on the cross, when he said, it is finished, that could have been like, you know, time cracking itself. And maybe that's we'll all see that at once and then bam, he'll come in the sky or something like that. That's the way I kind of imagine it. Um, Okay, so you see that it's all about Jesus. <laughs> it's all uh, all the earth and everything on it is Jesus and for Jesus and held together by Jesus. Okay, so let's now look at Psalms 24, uh, verses 2 through 4. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Hallelujah, right? So that's Jesus, of course. Uh, 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 Jesus was led in Jerusalem, uh, in the, the king, the king's city, and um, to the mountain of uh, Golgotha, right? Or Calvary, or the place of the skull. Okay, Calvary also means skull. If you know, the hill is gold, which is pretty interesting. Um, 
and we know, you know, that that all goes back to Genesis 3.15, you know, he will crush his head and you only bruise his heel, right? Um, all right, so um, John 19, 16 through 17 says this. Uh, then delivered he him, uh, therefore, un them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. Uh, and, he, and he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Golgotha, right? Okay, so you see in Psalms, it says, um, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? Only Jesus could stand in that holy place to take all the sins away from the world and take the wrath of God, right? And he was led, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Well, it's all the Lord's, right? But it was destined to be that way because it's the place, it's the place of the skull. That's where he crushed his head. He crushed his skull, right? And it's also taught by uh, people that that's where David took Goliath's head and put it there in that hill. That's why it's called Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull, right? And that's pretty interesting, right? Okay. Um, also, uh, Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right side and one on the left. Okay, so you see they went up the hill. Okay. Um, let's see. Jesus stands in the holy place. Jesus literally stands in the holy place. And we can see that in uh, Hebrews 9, 24 through 28. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. Right, right? the heavenly holy places where Jesus is. <laughs> That's awesome, right? Into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. See, that's what I was talking about. He's slain on the cross from the foundation of the world, right? But yet, at the fullness of time, bam, he was crucified, right? And then at the end, it's the same crucifixion. So that's why I kind of believe that that right there, like Hebrews also is speaking about the sign of the Son of Man. When it comes, you'll see the crucifixion in the sky splitting reality. It is finished, you know, right? It, 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 it is begun from the foundation of the world, and then it is finished at the end, right? You see, like, I, that's just why I believe the sign of the Son of Man will be like but um you see he only need to be crucified once and okay so i hope that makes sense <laughs> and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation hallelujah um, also, we can see Mark 14, 61 through 62, which says, uh, But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, uh, the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, uh, coming in the clouds of heaven. Right? Okay. So he's in the holy place at the right hand, the Son of Man coming, like Daniel 7, right? The cloud rider, the Son of Man. Um, okay. Now, let's see. Um, Jesus is without sin and pride, right? It, because it says in verse 4, he, he that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to vanity or pride or worthlessness or emptiness, nor sworn deceitfully, okay? And usually that when you do that kind of stuff, it's about pride, you know, um, before the fall comes pride. But Jesus was none of those things. Um, and we can see that in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, which says, Come unto me, all ye that are laden and he that are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lean on, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Right? 
So he doesn't put all that extra stuff on you. Like he talks about the Pharisees and stuff, you know, they put heavy burdens on people, but they won't carry them themselves. Um, also, we can see in 1 Peter 2, 22, says, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Okay, And that goes back to verse 4 also. Um, who has not lifted up his soul um, to vanity or sworn deceitfully. Um, okay, so now let's look at uh, Psalms 24, 5 through 6, which says this. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. Hallelujah. And righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Selah. Right, I love that. Okay, so um, the Father blesses the Son, right? And we can see that in Matthew 3, 17 and Matthew 17, 5, which says, um, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That's a, a good blessing, right? Okay, uh, 17, 5 says, While he yet spoke, behold, a, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which saith, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, right? Listen to him. <laughs> so those are blessings, right? The father blesses the son. Um, uh, and uh, his righteousness, um, he's blessed with his righteousness, uh, a righteousness from God. And we can see that in Romans 3, 22, which says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So, of course, his righteousness is on him, and then it's delivered to us. Hallelujah for that. <laughs> uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 20-21 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did besiege you by us, we pray you in uh, Christ's steed, by your reconcili reconciliation uh, to God, for he, for he, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right. Okay. So seek, seek Jesus today in your generation. Um, and um, other generations to come, okay? And that is because of uh, Psalms 24, 6. It says, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek your face, O Jacob, or Israel, right? Uh, Selah, okay. So we want to seek Jesus today and in our generation and for more generations to come, if any more last. Um, and we can see that in Matthew 6. 16 4 a wicked and adulterous generation seek after a sign and there shall be no sign but given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas and he left them and departed okay so it's very interesting you seek after a sign you want signs uh, but really the only sign we need to be looking for is Jesus in his crucifixion and resurrection and Jesus second coming watch right that's the signs we need to be looking for and focused on. Um, uh, 1 Peter 2, uh, 6 through 10 says this. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Hallelujah. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. It's interesting if you compare this, uh, 1 Peter 2, with Romans 1. It's kind of interesting if you ever want to do that. Whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, Hallelujah. a royal priesthood, and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and i like that a Which, peculiar people a special people or uh, or a separated people right or really what it's saying is god's own people in time past were not a people but are now the people of god which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy okay 
So you see that, okay? So now let's look at um, Psalms 24, 7 through 10, which says this. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? Jesus. <laughs> the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Hallelujah. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Hallelujah. Who is this King of glory? Jesus. The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Amen, right? So I think this is very interesting because this goes back to, it's interesting how I'll do one study and then it relates to another study with the dimensions and everything. I mean, look, if this is gates, doors, they open, the everlasting doors, the portals, all this stuff, okay? This is portals and doors and gateways into other dimensions and stuff, right? Other spiritual realms, other heavens. And Jesus is the, the key holder to all that, right? He is the way into all of this stuff because he created all of this stuff. So it's really interesting if you look at it that way, right? Um, verses 7 and 9 say, um, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, or portals, or, you know, whirlwinds, and be lifted, uh, lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in, right? He came in, um, and verse 9 says basically the same thing. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Right, so he came in to our dimension to fix everything, right? And then also he goes out, he comes in. You know, he's the, oh, really the only ones who can do that. He can have complete control of doing that, right? So I think that's pretty awesome. Um, so Jesus is the gate. Matthew 7, um, uh, 13 through 14 says, Enter ye at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Okay, so what's he saying? He's saying that he is the gate, right? Because he is the door, and that leadeth to heaven, right? To eternal life in paradise, in you know, with the Father. Um, and then there's another gate, another portal or dimension that you can go to um, that will open for you if you want to go to hell, right? If you don't want to believe. So it's pretty crazy. Um, and then also, uh, uh, Jesus is the gate and the door. And we can see that in uh, John 10, 1 through 10. John 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Okay, so anyone else who tries to get to paradise, to these other dimensions, and especially to where the Father is, to the other spiritual realms outside of this life, is a thief and a robber, right? They're satanic, because who's a thief? Satan, right? So it's like there are thieves and robbers trying to break their way in, right? To like Nimrod with the Tower of Babel, okay? Right? They it, it, they weren't literally making a tower tower. They were trying to make a portal to God, to attack him, to wage war on him because of the flood. So they were they were thieves and robbers. And what does it say? And we're going to see in verse ten: thief comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. So they were trying to come through the door to do bad things, right? But it's not possible without Jesus. Or you can go through a door, but it's the door to, to the lake of fire to the second death. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name. And, and it's interesting, I'm sorry, it's interesting if you see, to him the porter opens. The porter is the gatekeeper. Okay, and now what do we see in Genesis 3, 24, right? Where the, the cherub with the flaming sword, okay, is spinning it around, splitting, splitting the, um, the way, the way, Jesus, to the, to the uh, Garden of Eden. Okay, you see that? So the sword was literally a, a portal into this other dimension, and it was being split and, and stopped by the cherub, the gatekeeper. You see that? And leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow. But 
Because see here, if we go back to Matthew 7, that narrow gate, it only has to be wide enough really for one man to go through, and that was Jesus, right? And so the shepherd goes through the narrow gate, and what happens? The sheep follow behind him straight through the narrow gate. But goats will just run through the wide gate and wide path that leads to death and destruction and wolves and lions and everything else eating them, right? Would flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Hallelujah. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So you see, there were many people who were trying to tell, even back then, that this is how you get eternal life. This is how you get into other spiritual realms. This is how, this is how. These are so-called uh, false gods. These so-called, like, all these things, you know, uh, messiahs and all this other stuff. But they're all liars, right? And just like after him, there came many, but they're all liars and thieves and robbers. They all want something from you. Jesus is the only one who gives everything of himself to you. I am the door. And all he expects back is love, right, and belief. <laughs> and how easy is that? By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. Hallelujah. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Amen, right? Hallelujah for that. Um, okay, so Jesus is the gate uh, and the door. Uh, open your door to him and he will come in and fix you. Open your heart, open your soul, open your spirit, and Jesus will fix you if you open the door to him, right? And we can see that in Revelations 3, uh, 7 and 8. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. And and what what's interesting about that, the key of David, uh, David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, he that openeth, and no one shall shutteth, and shutteth, and no man shall openeth. Um, I know thy works. Behold, I, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. They had great faith, and because of their faith and belief in Jesus Yeshua, the door will not be closed to them no matter what. Okay. Uh, Revelations 3, 20 and 21. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will soup with him and, and he with me. Um, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sit down with my father in his throne. Isn't that awesome? So he's at the right throne of God, the right the right hand of the throne of God, the father sitting down. He said he's going to let us come sit just like he's doing, right? Because everything he did was an example for us to do, you see? Coming in, like he said in, in verse 9, uh, John 10, verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and shall come out and find pasture. So the same way he jumps into these different dimensions and all this stuff, we will, after everything is fixed, I believe we'll be able to do things like that too, kind of. You know, like what the new earth, what do you think the new earth is going to be like? Okay, like, right. Anyway, that's another, uh, another study. <laughs> Okay, so we're almost done. So verses in Psalms 24, verse 8 and 10 says, Who is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Who is the King of glory? Uh, the Lord of hosts uh, is the King of glory. Selah, right? So we know who it is. It's Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, right? But he's also a great warrior, right? He's the Lion of Judah. And uh, we can see that in Revelations 19, uh, 11 through 16. And also you can see in Exodus where it says the Lord is a warrior. The warrior is his name, right? Okay. So let's listen to this. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. Hallelujah. And in righteousness... He doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Hallelujah. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. See, that's like us on those coming into the different portals and dimensions and whirlwinds coming back and forth, going in and going out with him, right? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> the sheep following the shepherd. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Right, so isn't that interesting that he, he took the wrath of God and and um, he treads the wine presses. He smashes them down of the fierce and wrath. Right. So he took it all the wrath of God onto himself, and now he yields the wrath of God. Isn't that pretty awesome? And it's it's um, he is the Lord of Hosts. Yes, the hosts of the armies of angels, holy angels, but also the ar the Lord of Hosts of armies of us, the saints with him. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And I, so that's who we serve, right? Yeshua HaMashiach, right? The King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord of Hosts, the King of Glory, okay? So um, I hope you all enjoy this. Uh, should be back, Lord willing, tomorrow with another one. Uh, wake and watch for Yeshua. God is love and I love God. Amen.